Well, good morning. Today we start a seven-week series, or a seven-message series, I don't think it'll be seven weeks in a row, but a seven-message series on the seven statements of I am that Jesus said in John. And to look at them real quick, I am the bread of life, that's where we're starting today. I am the light of the world, I am the door of the sheep, I am the good shepherd, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I am the true vine. These seven vivid say sayings all indicate that Jesus is somehow making God present. He is speaking as God. And we come by the I am through Exodus. In Exodus 3, Verse 13 through 14, Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell him? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this family and this home that we gather in. Lord, we know that as we come together, that you, the I am, are among us. And that as we go into your word and we start to speak the sacred things that have been written, Lord, we know that your spirit is among us. And we ask that you stir in our souls and you stir us to hear the message that you have for us. That uh, this might be a wonderful time of, uh, of learning and inspiration and worship. We say these things in your son's name. Amen. In the Old Testament, God identifies himself as the I am who I am. In these sayings, Jesus is saying, I too am the God who is I am who I am. Thus, if we want bread that is spiritual food that lasts forever, we are to come to Jesus to be fed. If we want light to find our way in this dark world, then Jesus is that light. If we want to find the way to God, we come to Jesus, who is the way to heaven and the gate at the end. If we want to rise anew after death, the only, then only Jesus can give us this gift. If we, want to, if we want care and protection along life's way, then Jesus offers this as the good shepherd. And if we want to know the presence of God in our life, then we need to abide in Jesus, the true vine. As I was preparing this week, I started to think about bread, and, and I'll admit that um, I didn't grow up in a house that was baking fresh bread daily, so I didn't have this um, longing for the smell of fresh bread. My mother baked bread twice a year in Thanksgiving and Christmas, and she baked date nut bread, and that smell will always remind me of those types of, those times of years and growing up with my mother, but I do have another bread recollection for a time, I, I lived in College Station, and so I would take I-35 South. And when I left Dallas-Fort Worth to go to College Station, I would be making that wonderful trek down I-35, and lo and behold, the smell of yeast, not bread, but of brewing yeast would hit me, and it would fill the car, and for about 30 seconds, there was that sour smell of the Miller Brewing Company coming through the air conditioning vents, but then after about 30 seconds, the car would start to fill with the smell of baking bread. And I'll always remember that. And it was a great, a great thing to set me on my journey. When I would come home from College Station and I would come north on I-35, I knew I was getting close to town because that smell would fill my car and I'd have the wonderful smell of baking bread and it'd fill my car and I'd smile. And then I think reality would hit because then here comes the Miller Brewing Company and... <laughs> traffic and everything else that came along with coming back to the Dallas-Fort Worth area. But for us in our, in our society right now, bread is an accompaniment. Bread is a, um, a luxury of sorts. Uh, Jennifer and I have a couple of uh, restaurants that we really enjoy, and ironically, bread is part of what we really enjoy about those. We go to Outback a lot, and they start out the meal with that little loaf of brown bread, and it's always hot, and the butter melts, and it's a wonderful thing. It kind of starts the meal. 
Another place that we go to is Johnny Carino's, and they've got a wonderful Italian bread that's got a hard crust, and they give you like this olive oil and garlic mixture, and it's just great. But it's just kind of to whet your appetite. In contrast, in the Mediterranean world at the time of Jesus, bread was substantive. It was what kept you alive. You worked hard every day to have your bread every day. If you had bread and a little water or a little wine, then you had a meal. If you were fortunate enough to have some protein along with that, maybe a slice of meat or some fish, then you were doing very well. And you knew that you were highly blessed if you were able to have some dates along with that. And so the bread in that time and what Jesus is speaking about today or then is very different than what we hear today. Jesus isn't saying that I'm a freshly baked loaf of Mrs. Baird's bread that you can walk to the counter and get at any point in time. But he is saying, I am what you need to live. I'm the only one who can really nourish you along life's journey. So we, we meet the word this morning in John 6, and just previous to um, what we're going to talk about this morning, Jesus has healed the sick. And so um, that's in chapter 5. It's good stuff. You ought to read it. The crowd followed him from one side to the other um, because of his reputation. So they're seeking him out. And so the beginning of John 6 has us where Jesus feeds the 5,000, which really isn't 5,000 because they only counted men, and so probably it was more like 15,000. And he performs a miracle of feeding that group with five loaves and two fish. Again, that's really good stuff. You ought to read it. At this point, Jesus knows that the people are going to try and forcibly make him king. And so he goes and he hides out for the night, and his disciples, they head out in boats. They go across the lake. Um, Jesus then walks out three or four miles on the water, freaks out his disciples. They let him into the boat. As soon as, they get into the, as, soon as he gets into the boat, they apparate to the other side of the lake. And the Harry Potter isn't, uh, that, that reference isn't biblical, that's just mine. And so that kind of brings us to where we are now. And we're going to start in John 6, verse 22. The next day the crowd that had stayed on the opposite shore of the lake realized that only one boat had been there. And that Jesus had not entered it with his disciples, but they had gone away alone. Then some boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten and the, eaten the bread after the Lord had given them thanks. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boat and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, you're not, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Today I'm going to point out four things and encourage us to not follow the crowd. And this is the first of those four things. The crowd was concerned with their physical needs and not their spiritual condition. Imagine if one night you heard Jesus Say to us, I have a wonderful gift waiting for you. If you're anything like me, my first thought is probably going to go to how big is my blessing? How much money am I going to get? Is, is there a new car waiting in the driveway? Do I have a great vacation? Did you actually give me the lottery numbers this time? We so easily count our blessings in a material way. But what we need to know is everything that we have is a gift from God, including all of our material blessings. As Danny said this morning, the material is not evil. However, Jesus' teaching constantly reminds us that there is something more important than money, than home, than cars, than vacations. It's a relationship with the God, it's a relationship with God that is revealed in Jesus Christ and made present through the Holy Spirit. If we want life in all of its fullness, then we need most of all the bread that Jesus alone can give. Only this, sustaining, only this can sustain us along life's journey and prepare us for the life to come. Verse 27, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures the eternal life, to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. 
If you're anything like me, this as well as this as well is a daily struggle. I struggle every day to keep my eyes out of the mirror and focused on myself and look to Jesus. I struggle every day working for the food that spoils. I look around and um, one of the lessons that I'm trying to teach my children as they grow up and they start to have money of their own is even just don't spend all your money on food. There's, it, doesn't, it doesn't give you anything in the end. You just get bigger and spend money trying to lose it. So you've got to, that, that's a constant struggle for me is to, is to not work for food that spoils and spend more time working for Jesus. In verse 28, then they ask him, what must we do to do the work that God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. And some of the commentaries that I read said this was a big step, that these people were actually seeking Jesus, as opposed to before, where sometimes they weren't even seeking him. So this was a good thing that they were asking him, well, well you know, Rabbi, what do we need to do? What are the works that God requires? And Jesus, in such a simple way, gives us a wonderful command. He states what we need to do, just to believe in him and what he has taught us. Verse 30, so they ask him, what sign will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And this is my second point this morning. The crowd was not satisfied with what Jesus had shown him. This crowd was made up of intelligent people, educate, well, I won't say intelligent, educated people. Jewish people, they had just seen Jesus heal the sick. They had just seen Jesus feed the 5,000. They have no explanation on how he got to the other side of the lake, and yet they stand there and they ask for signs so that they may believe. Ethel was an older woman, and she lived in a, in a nice home. And uh, the weather was coming. The weatherman had said there's going to be lots of rain on the way and so the rain comes, and Ethel sits on her porch, and she watches the rain. And her neighbors come over, and they say, Ethel, this is going to be a pretty bad storm. We're going to go into town where there's higher ground. Would you like to join us? And she says, oh, no, I'm safe. My Lord will keep me safe. And she's on a rocking chair, and, and the rain keeps coming, and the water gets higher, and the fire trucks come down the road, and they say, Ethel, the water's coming up. Let's take you to the higher ground. And she says, oh, no, the Lord will keep me safe. And the water keeps rising, and she goes into her house because now it's taken over the porch. And they come cruising by on a boat. And they say, Ethel, come with us. Let us save you. We're going to go to higher ground. And she says, oh, no, the Lord will save me. And the water gets higher, and she's on her upper balcony, and here comes the helicopter. And the helicopter says, ma'am, let us save you. She says, my Lord will save me. And the helicopter flies away. She passes away and she's in heaven and she's speaking with God and she says, God, why did you abandon me? Why, did you save, why didn't you save me? And God says, I sent your neighbors, the fire department, a boat and a helicopter. What else do I need to do? And I think that that is very, very applicable for myself because... I know that a lot of times I ignore the signs. I ignore the way that he's working in my life because it's not exactly what I have in mind for that solution. But thankfully for us, God is patient. Jesus says to them in verse 32, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. At first thought, we ask, how can the crowd miss the point that Jesus spoke of bread that truly satisfies? Why did they think first of ordinary bread? And the answer is because they're just like us. The material rewards of life were more pressing and attractive than the spiritual rewards. What they wanted was an unending supply of bread that would make their daily life easier. But then Jesus says it plain. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. 
Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus is contrasting the, the manna from Moses. The manna was life-sustaining, but not life-giving. Jesus is the true bread, which is life-giving and permanently satisfying. Note here that Jesus does not say, come to church each week and you will get the bread of life. Or working for the poor and the needy will earn you the bread of life. Or even believing in God will give you the bread of life. Jesus is the bread of life, and he gives this bread to those who believe in him. That is, those who recognize that in Jesus, God is at work to save. So trust in him. Verse 36, but as I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven to do my will, to not do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this will be, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of those who he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. At this, the Jews began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They say, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? And this is my next point. The crowd began to grumble. The Savior stands in front of them. They've seen the signs. They've been fed by miracles. But when the claim is made, they do not believe. They say, don't we know your parents? How many times do we turn a blind eye to the signs? How many times do we forget the blessings and start to, our, start to say to ourselves or each other, sure that happened, but what about the time that nothing has happened? What about this? What about that? Yes, God is good, but what about that one time? I encourage you to not follow the crowd. Jesus has a word for them. Stop grumbling amongst yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. Here's the second time that Jesus is telling them that he is the bread of life. I'm certainly glad that Jesus understands that sometimes I don't get it on the first go-round. And verse 49, your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. Jesus is certainly pulling no punches with this crowd. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. Verse 51, I am the living bread. Here is the third time that Jesus tells, uh, tells us that he is the bread. And he must know that I'm not a very good listener. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give the light which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews begin to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And that is my last point this morning. The crowd begin to argue amongst themselves. How perfect a picture of nature this crowd has been. Selfish, blind, ungrateful, and now they're turning on each other. I don't know about you, but I can certainly relate to this crowd. I have the word of God sitting in front of me. I've experienced his miracles. I've seen his blessings. I've heard his voice, and yet I still doubt. Still I wonder. Still I argue. Still I question. My call for us today is this. Don't follow the crowd. Keep our eyes on Jesus. Remember his love. Listen to his promises. Believe in his power. Don't follow the crowd. We're blessed. Don't follow the crowd. We are his children. Don't follow the crowd. We are his chosen. We are his and he is ours.